Okay. So, Kimberly, how did you come to start Aikido? Um, I was studying with uh, Trungpa Rinpoche in Naropa University, and also a woman, Barbara Dilly, a dance teacher. It was my senior year of college. Um, my mother had just passed away, and so I was looking for a way to um, heal my soul. And uh, in the uh, the moments of dancing with Barbara Dilly and uh, practicing with Trungpa, I, I came, I stumbled across uh, Aikido, and that was it. I saw it the first day while I was on the dance floor, this beautiful woman spinning through space with this black hakama and this crisp white gi, and that was it. Uh, I never looked back. I have been training ever since. So what was it that what was it that spoke to your soul when you first tried it out then? I, I, uh, I really felt the incredible uh, spiral motion and sense of uh, people coming together and then the parting and, and that breath rhythm of the exchange that people were having. And probably one of the really important things for me was the fact that it wasn't a competitive art. I mean as compared with dancing where there's always um, an emphasis to perform. Wow. For me, I was very drawn to the sense of everyday practice without some sense of having to have a, a goal to quote, quote unquote, get better. Um, I just, I, I really wanted to just have a spiritual movement practice. Yeah. Okay. So um, guys, I, I've got quite a lot of qu and girls, well, quite a lot of questions to ask. And at the end, if you've got any questions that you want to ask, then please do. And if there are any supplementaries you want to ask to the questions I'm asking, then, then chip in, okay? So if you put your hand up or something like that, so I know. Okay, so who was or is your biggest influence in Aikido and why? Well, besides, besides O-sensei, um, my, um, my teacher, Mary Heine Sensei, was the first teacher I had and 42 years later, she remains um, a teacher that uh, is inspiring to me for her immense ability to be a human being. Um, she's, she is just exactly what you see and what you get. She studies deeply. She has a great sense of humor. And um, I think she uh, has devoted her life to this, this practice in a, in a way that really inspires me. Yeah. And who else has influenced your study and in what ways? I've been really, really blessed with uh, really extraordinary teachers. I also, that's part of my nature is that I really, I go out and reach for it. Um, uh, Saotome Sensei and Ikeda Sensei came to the dojo, Seattle School of Aikido early in my training career. And I was encouraged by Mark Reeder, one of my friends and uh, senpai to train with those two teachers very early on. So. Um, I attended most years of the Boulder camp that Ikeda Sensei um, arranged, and um, and also I went to Shingu uh, a decade into my practice, and I had the great fortune of training with Ikezuchi Sensei and Ano Sensei and Ase Sensei, Tojima Sensei, uh, those teachers in Shingu, and um, I'll just never forget that experience. It was just, it, it went straight to my soul. The uh, to my soul all. Okay. I think that every teacher has their own way in, of doing Aikido. They are their own people uh, and they inspire in different ways. So what was it about Sarutomi you particularly liked and Ikeda? If you can go through those names and just say, what was the main thing you maybe took from each of them? Uh, Sautami can say one word, posture. It's just his, his stance, his elegance, his, uh, his ability. Every, every year in Missoula, he would say to be or not to be. And he absolutely made meaning of, of his stature and ability uh, to say that martial art is actually about um, posture. That it's how you stand in the world and, and the stance you take. And I... I will always, always uh, have gratitude for uh, his teachings in, in that way. Yeah. Okay. okay. And Akeda Sensei? Oh, do you want to ask a question, Piers? Uh, it wasn't a question. I, I, just that phrase, because um, I, I, 
I'm being very influenced by my son, who's a chiropractor, about posture. And as you get up, you watch, you watch everybody start to lean forward and, and sort of topple into the center. And, and it's something that I'm really, really keen on. Uh, and I love that phrase. It's not just your posture on the map, you're standing in the world. That is just a fabulous phrase. Thank you. Well, you're back at you for even really uh, highlighting it. Thank you, really. Okay. And Ikeda really? Sensei? Ikeda Sensei has become a in really incredible friend over the years, but um, early on was an extremely attentive teacher. I went to study with him when I was a third Q, I broke my foot in his hakama, like day three. And I tried every day to jump on that mat for three or four months. And every day I could not. And every day I watched class uh, in his dojo in the um, high school um, in uh, Boulder, Colorado. Um, I've, I've trained with him most years for my life. And um, his sense of, um, in the early years, the ukemi I got to take from him uh, made me, I think, um, the teacher I am, because uh, I think you really learn how to be a teacher by taking ukemi. And it was fierce and scary and fantastic. Um, and I've always felt incredible um, uh, mutual respect. I, I, I was always treated well by him. Um, and, and, uh, I'll to, to, to five different deaths. I'll, I'll always, um, be, um, so grateful. Glenn, I've got a question there. Uh, could you expand upon the, uh, the link between taking you Kemi and being a, a good teacher? Yeah, I really believe that, uh, the degree to which you can experience the, tra the, uh, the uh, transmission of the teacher through the the sensory ability, the the, the neuromuscular, the the vibration, the um, ability of, of an of a of a teacher to have that 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 quality of touch and pulse. I learned how to save my life taking falls um, at great speed, um, and I learned how to get back up and uh, brush off any ch challenge and be right there again. And that was extremely character building, I think, because I was a shy person. I was pretty insecure, but I, getting back on my feet, that made sense without having to be cognitive about it. That's great, thank you. And Ano Sensei, Kimberly? Ano Sensei? Ano Sensei is the teacher of the heart. There's just no question about it. Uh, from the beginning, he would speak to don't throw, but blend. Um, now his message is extremely about, it's all about Kokoro. It's all about their get rid of the Nage, recognize that the relationship is about a coming together and then some sort of ecumenical way to um, complete the conversation only to begin it again. Uh, his, he is still, still going to the dojo, still um, pre presenting, uh, practicing the Norito and practicing Shinkoku on a daily basis. He drives his little truck down to his dojo every morning except Sunday and uh, trains. And um, his devotion is, on, is, 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 is uh, amazing. So for, for lack the, of a more fancy word. <laughs> so for the benefits of the audience, how old is he now? I think he's 88. Mm -hmm. Great stuff, thank you. So what do you see as the key benefits of studying Aikido? It's a way to stay, um, it's a way to imagine that you could, alt you could transform the world uh, into a place where we really actually cared about each other as human beings in a spectacularly normal and humane way. Anything else? Well, sure, there's a lot of, uh, <laughs> the sense of community is the most important thing for me, I think. Um, it started with three or four people and, and just the community that I have on a daily basis and in my, where I live is one thing and then it expands out like ripples. Um, you know, I run rivers uh, most of my life and being in, on a river, there's no question that you're always connected. 
there's also no question you're always okay. You're always uh, at the mercy of the river, really. But the river will respect you if you're smart. And, um, and I feel that way with a sense of community that if you really, if you're really genuine about it, um, it gives back to you and there's this pulse, it's a breath. And, and every day that informs me and every day I'm grateful for, uh, for the people that I've come to know intimately uh, at, on uh, all different levels, including yourself, Quentin. We've, we've had now, I don't know how many years, but, but it's a friendship that uh, happened because of Aikido. True. And it probably will go on for the rest of our lives. So, I'm you know, happy. yeah. Well, what's 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 to not make that go? You know. Sure. So, uh, perhaps expanding on that a little bit, what are the things that Aikido has given you personally? What are the greatest gifts and things that you think it's given you? Oh, my brilliance. <laughs> <laughs> My husband. Well, that's a good start. Is he a gorgeous husband? <laughs> and, of course, and of course, your modesty. <laughs> yeah. I didn't say I was gorgeous. I said my husband was gorgeous. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I make a joke of it, but he did walk into the dojo in 1990, and uh, my eyes just went over there, and that was kind of it. So, uh, yeah, it has had an impact for sure. Um, Again, I have had the opportunity to hang out with spectacular human beings because of Aikido and each of those teachers. I mean, I just wrote a piece on Terry Dobson and my memories of, of traveling with him down the West Coast for, for five or six days and the hilarity of that and the honor of that. And when, you're, when you get to be with people that have a level or an aura of majesty or just clarity and charisma and majesty almost you know you get to you get to feel that and and um steal it if you could so yeah it's it's been palpable to be with people that are really attempting to unify the world in in their own ways and i believe in that wholeheartedly that we could we can do it so you started in 1978 by my reckoning that's 42 years how do you keep your practice fresh? Good question. That's a great uh, that's question. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, it's in my, it's in my cells. So um, I wake up most days and, um, and uh, do some form of gratitude practice. Whether it's, uh, I, won't, I won't say that I do Shinko Q every day, but every day I'm moving um, through space in an Arimi and Tenkan like-minded way. And I am every day expressing gratitude for, um, for the life I have and the people that have been um, so delightful to, take, to, to be with me and to take care of me and to see me really, to be seen and, and to see back. Right. So, good question. That, yeah. that's good. It's all good. All good. Um, so, I know that you do have done in the past many other things related, well, maybe related to Aikido, maybe they're not. What other things have you studied that you think have had a direct impact on your Aikido? Well, dancing for sure. Um, I've done, um, as a child, I, I danced, and as an adult, I practice. Um, ballroom dancing, particularly, um, particularly Latin dancing was very helpful to my understanding of hip motion and connection and, and again, posture, you know, my dance teacher was always yelling at me that I didn't have a frame and I would try to argue back like, but that's what I teach in Aikido and he would go, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> work harder. <laughs> I remember going to a dance class. What was that thing that you did? The, the sort of uh, Latin dance in Piers? Uh, I did. Well, no, it wasn't Latin. It was uh, more rock and roll. It was um, Ciroc. What name? What was the call? Ciroc. Ciroc. Okay. Ciroc. Went to a Ciroc oh, class. Uh, and exactly the same experience. So I'm there for the first night and I'm being told to relax. I'm saying, but this is what I teach. What do you mean I'm not relaxed? <laughs> 
Exactly. But Pierce doesn't have that problem, right? No, he uh, always <laughs> relaxed. <laughs> so dancing, anything else? Yes, Tai Chi. Tai Chi has been amazing. I've been doing Tai Chi for 20 years. I have an incredible teacher, Ken Wright. The practice of opening and closing, the practice of, of uh, silk reeling, the practice of um, expanding and contracting. Um, the, it's really, really uh, um, impacted my Aikido deeply. And I do do Tai Chi every day. I do do the Chen uh, 48 every day and, and, uh, and sometimes two or three times. And I'll walk down the streets doing the form and people think I'm nuts. No one's arrested me yet, but you know. It's probably very good for your social distancing though, isn't it? <laughs> Just shoot me. <laughs> Uh, is there anything else? Yeah. I, you, you've led quite an interesting sort of career as well. You studied all sorts of things. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, you're so kind, you know. Rivers have been huge because um, I've been running rivers since I was, since I was a little girl um, because my father was a fisherman. Uh, that was what he loved to do um, when he wasn't uh, as a hobby and a practice. And he took me all over the rivers of the West Coast. And... Uh, I, so I began rowing at a young age, but when I began to work as an oarsman on the large rivers of the United States, the Colorado, the Snake, and the Salmon Rivers, um, I would be on those rivers for five, eight, sometimes 12 days in a row with passengers, and, and all the water, the water levels change constantly. The, the, everything shifts, and you've got to go from point A to point B. So you have to be fearless, and I'm terrified of water. So it, it's always me facing probably one of the biggest fears of my life. Um, and and uh, don't ask me more about that because people kind of think I'm nuts to be doing something that I'm scared of all the time, but it, it works for me. I think that's what interviewers do. They do ask, when you give an interesting answer, they got to prove. <laughs> um, so I'm interested. So there you were, this slight young lady taking groups of people down these rapids, how did they react to you? Well, that depends. First couple of days, they'll stay as far away from me as possible, so only the people that are left at the very end have to get stuck in my boat. But <laughs> a couple of days go by, and they see how smooth I am, and they see how, because I'm small, I would never battle with the river. I would always try to tuck myself into the eddy sweetly. And then I had a really fantastic teacher there too, Lonnie Hudson, who early on I spent a lot of time with, just the two of us running these, these rivers in flood in the spring. And I learned how to just do those things that we do in Aikido so gently and, and uh, smoothly. And, and um, you know, I, uh, when they could, figure out they wouldn't die, they would. They began to jump in my boat, so. There seems to me to be a real parallel with you as a, 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 a lay a female teacher on the mat. You know, there's mm. still much fewer, there are many more women teachers in the States than there are in the UK. Mm. Still by far in the minority, I would think. How is yeah. it for you as a female teacher doing a martial art, how, is that, how does that work? Has it been a strength, a weakness, has it, what, what, there's probably pros and cons. Well, I think I, I've had uh, incredible women role models. Uh, obviously, Mary Heine Sensei is terrific. And then early on, I, I had the opportunity to, be called, to, to know Linda Holiday Sensei and uh, Danielle Smith. And, um, and then there's Joanne Veneziano, who, who I grew up with, who's fierce, my God, good luck. And um, so I've had those women, but also I've had men who treated me like um, I, was a, um, I was a human being. Ikeda Sensei never once said to me, well, you're a girl, so da, 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 never once. And uh, Terry Dobson would never do that either. So uh, there, there's a way that you have to stand up for yourself, of course. But as I move, as I move into my years of Aikido, it's, it's so much about um, not, not connecting with personality. 
So I don't really, I don't have as much fear about trying to throw a big person because I'm not, that's not my intent. My, I want to, I, I connect with the intention uh, before I connect with physicality. So I feel like um, I've been blessed to be a woman in this art. I agree. Um, when you look at the Aikido world generally, do you think it's fulfilling Osensi's mission? Mm. Well, Quentin, you and I had this conversation uh, uh, an hour ago about what we might think is the silver lining of COVID. And really, we are uh, absolutely required to go inside. And, and uh, for those of us who are going to tap into it at all, just stop. You know, literally stop. I mean, the, 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 the planet is asking us to reflect on, on our impact on it. And um, so I think that that's the time for us to really be reevaluating what is uh, Aikido and how can it contribute to the healing of the planet. Are you hopeful that we as a community can have a significant impact? I don't think there's any other way to go. I really truthfully don't think there's any way to go. I, I, I think that hope is what uh, binds us together and I think that it's not being stupid. Um, it's just suggesting that intention to um, move things forward using Aikido is, is, uh, is what is upon us, uh, you know. For me, it's not really a question. It's, a, it's more of a, how do we go about this that was now? My, that, interestingly, was my next question. Hello, Craig. Yeah, please. Um, in England or in the UK, the uh, Aikido societies, I mean, it's, it's a fractured society. There's split upon split upon split. So, uh, do you see in America that splitting or is it coming together? Boy, that is a really incredible question, Pierce. And I don't know that I really am in a fantastic place to speak um, to the entirety of the uh, community in the United States because, I, like you, I feel like there's a lot of different organizations and some of them are respectful to each other and others of them um, have a real different tangent. Um, so I, I think, with, I, think mo I would play the modesty uh, card here and speak to uh, the organizations that I feel very uh, aligned with and I'm working with. And that is like the California Aikido Association. Um, Michael Friedel and I work very closely together and also um, the teachers that uh, really are aligned through the Shingu um, lineage. So. Um, and then I'm always looking at how can Aikido go out to larger people who don't know anything about it yet, thinking that that's our goal for the future too, is to open up the doors to those who have not yet actually touched it. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think that's a full question, answer for you, Pierce. Well, no, that's they, no, that's very interesting. And, and then what's your approach when you, when you try and make these, uh, uh, reaching out to, to other organizations, you know, maybe commercial, industrial, uh, financial. How do you do that? And, and do you do it positively at the moment? Well, at the moment, at this very moment, it, it's taken, for me, it's an incredible effort to keep, I probably have a couple of hundred people between the kids and the adults to attempt to uh, keep some al alliance with or some or some connectivity with in terms of my organization yeah. um, for, for all sorts of reasons and including financial obviously, but um, You know the goal of the Institute was actually to really build more of a lengthy community center and bring in other art forms that would connect um, back and forth together um, to kind of reach out to um, populations that aren't as fortunate as us and also to, uh, ex to really spread the teachings of, of Aikido into a larger spectrum. Um, so yeah, our, 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 our business plan is attempting every day to really um, get that um, going so that we can, we can develop the grants and the support, financial support to, to, um, to, to um, build out this building, which we have and have yet really to have the finances to be able to um, get going on yeah yeah so i mean there's so many there's so many ways to answer that question but at this moment in time 
it's quite an effort, I think, just to just to keep everybody kind of feeling in a rockabye baby kind of way together, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I used to go to the dojo, uh, like for example, on a Saturday morning, and I would I would be at, within a four hour period of all the different classes I was involved in or watching be taught. I would be able to see forty or fifty eyes and say, "Okay, you're fine. Okay, you need you need some attention. Okay, okay, I know what to do." But now, given it's an email thing or it's a Zoom thing, it's really different, and it and I think it takes a lot more work on my part um, and others I, I've spoken to feel the same way. Yeah, you've touched on yeah. a couple of times, Kimberly. You, you you've talked about the bigger picture of Aikido and taking it out into the world. Um, I thought, to me, is what Osensi's mission was all about. He said it was a tool to reconcile the world. So what do you think we should be doing as a community to get what we learn on the map out into the, the bigger world, the people that don't practice on the map? Well, you know, we all talk about these practices that um, can change the way that... Uh, we interact on, an, on a on a moment to moment level. Just for example, how we breathe. And, and of course, Aikido, I mean, you can't ignore your breath on the mat. I mean, because we get out of breath. So maybe one of the things that we're all doing right now is, is connecting our breath practices to a larger spectrum of, of being able to maintain your um, grounding and centering when you're in abject fear. And there's a tremendous, you know, it, it, this this city kind of started off this virus in a kind of a dramatic, violent way, if you will. I mean, we were one of the first cities to sort of peak and peak hard, and um, it created, and there's just a lot of fear around that. And I think, really, at the core, Aikido has something to tell us about how we live right and die right. And I think that we really need to be looking at what is uh, our the the process of death involved in our living and Aikido helps us look at that because when a sword's coming straight down on your head it's like you know straighten up and die right and um, I feel like we, there's some ways to be able to take those very radical teachings out into the world and I'm a big fan of Pema Chodron and I'm a big fan of um, Thich Nhat Hanh and I spent a lot of time studying that and Pema does weekend workshops on the power of really looking at your death. And I think that's a very important thing to do, particularly right, right now, because it's in our face. So I don't know if you want to get that deep, but that is what I think about quite a bit. It is a huge question. And boundless yeah. answers, really. But I don't think we're doing enough to get our message as a community out there. Um, it's it's tough, we? but... And I'm not a, I'm a pretty shy person, so it's not my real thing to just go to one, um, one uh, meeting after another nonprofit meeting to say, this is what I do. I, I kind of rely on some of my staff and, and my colleagues to, that are in my organization to do that. We have a parent group that a couple of them, they're really, they're really out there uh, talking to the nursery schools and the, and the middle-aged schools and getting more kids to come in and learn how to um, play together in non-competitive ways. So, for example. Okay. So, one of the beauties of Aikido for me is that it's something that we share and it's very interactive with other people, but in another way, it's very selfish because in order to develop ourselves, we have to practice with others. Um, mm. So, what are you working on in your personal practice now? What are you particularly looking to develop right now? What's the focus of your training? My posture, for one and always. Um, my ability to uh, increase my um, my my field, if you will, my awareness of my front and back, my up and down, my side side. Just moving through space, um, seeing myself be aligned in, 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 in not just my physical body, but my field, and hence when I'm interacting with others in, in that same way. I also think I'm trying to learn to speak the truth. So I'm trying to learn to really drop into my genuinity as much as possible and, and move from that place, as opposed to try to try something on and get by. 
So uh, I spent I, I spend a lot of time in meditation about that, and um, and I also ask the question, who am I? Who, who am I that I don't know who I am? So I I think that's a very very valid question to ask of, of each other. What do we think? Who do we think we are that we actually don't know who we are? So. Um, and Tom Reed Sensei is a very powerful teacher of mine, uh, and he asked that of me um, most days that I was training with him in Arcata, California, back in 1985. That's a very profound answer. Thank you. Um, what's the most recent revelation you've had in your study? <laughs> oh, wow. Woo! So, Pierce, what do you think? <laughs> oh, oh, I'm glad I'm not being interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Getting home from, uh, first from Guatemala and then from Hawaii. Um, uh, in this last month, I, I, was, in, um, I was sharing with, with Quentin that I had gone to Guatemala for a writing retreat. And uh, I left Guatemala on March 14th. Uh, March, uh, like six or something. And I think that in the time that I left that, the virus was, uh, was just starting to jump like crazy um, in our city. So then it's my, my partner's 70th birthday. So I'm going to Hawaii with him and, and people are going, don't go. And I went, I'm going. And getting home from there, the last flights that, uh, in the last days, the last flights, canceled flights, whatnot, having to, um, deal with all of that because at the time Hawaii didn't really believe that they could be susceptible to the virus. So there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of cacophony and miasma around it all. And trying to keep my cool um, was really a very big teaching. And now having to, I think, be extremely positive for the whole array of how people are doing it in my community and standing up and saying it, this we will heal and we will be deeper people for it and we will be more kind to each other that's probably the biggest teaching is just to stay true to these teachings even when you're scared so you'll know that um i put together the book the way to reconcile the world a collection of aikido stories from around the world of which mm. I, there are a few contributors on this on this call um can you think of a story that of how Aikido profoundly affected you in some sort of event in daily life that really sticks with you you'd like to share? Well, I, in I think there's a couple of times in my life, and all of you probably have had one, but a couple of times where, where you're taking your Kemi and... Uh, you, I'll just put it this way, you go through a rabbit hole. Like you go through, you go in and, and, and you come out the other side and you are, um, you're a transformed human being. You're a different person than when you went in. This happened to me um, with uh, Motomichi Ano Sensei, where I, I, I felt like my whole entire body just particleized and I came out the other side and I, I, uh, I felt I, I was something different. It took me, and, and to this day, I really examine that, but I, I've i also experienced that on rivers where I've hit, I've hit a rapid or I've hit something and been come out the other side of, of, a, of a swim. Um, and, and those experiences I touch on most days, particularly, for example, when, you know, something's going really awry and, I'm impatient and I'm, I'm, um, I'm tight and I, uh, I start to lose my temper and I just, how can I sit back and remember those experiences of, of where time and space just sort of shifted and um, there was so much more to life than I actually know. So I guess that is, that's not probably a perfect answer, but it is, um, it's really what I feel. Well, right. in perfect answers. No, that, that, that's a good answer. For, it's very interesting, but I would like to push the question again. Sure. Because I think what Quentin was getting at is, is can you think of a situation where 
you've interacted with uh, a member of the public, uh, a work colleague, um, you know, as a parent, whatever, where yeah. you're saying, thank God I train in Aikido. Yeah, you where a little oh, voice on your shoulder. Oh, sure. I did, I did something because of Aikido and that made that situation better. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Well, um, there was, yeah. You'll have to come back to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, if you come back to it, you have to write it down for the next book then. <laughs> um, okay, a sort of follow up to that. What's your proudest moment when a student's come to you and told you a story about, thank God I train in Aikido and thank you for all you've done because it transformed this situation? What's the story that most sticks out in your mind? Most recently, I have a really fantastic student who will rem remain anonymous, but his job is quite hefty and uh, he's responsible for opening up an, a very large corporation and, uh, overseas. And, um, and then this virus is, is, is here and, and uh, sort of the inequities of, of uh, handling uh, big business uh, in that way and, and, and telling me that dealing with his, uh, with his, his uh, groups and his, and his organization uh, has changed his life over and over and over again. And he's been with me for probably, mm, eight, you know, maybe 18 years and, um, constantly uh, offers gratitude for the um, the levels and the cha challenges that, that come with each level. And for example, what would a brown belt level look like versus what would a need on level challenge look like? And um, so, and I have so many people uh, who express gratitude for, for example, somebody who 50 years old, never done anything physical in her life, and then coming on the mat as a pretty profound international trauma therapist, and the transformation of her, her, her into a physical being, and having a sense of visceral impact uh, connected to what she teaches and um, counsels. She's just constantly um, saying how different it is. And now she's limited by what she does. So she sits in it, she trains in a chair and, um, and has opened me up to the idea that, you know, when we come back, there will be chairs on the mat because there are certain people who really actually need to train in that fashion. And I need to be open-minded to see how that could, how that could work. Lovely. Okay. We, we may be, it's an interesting time for Aikido, a lot of, particularly in America, where you know a lot of professional teachers, and you know this this gap brings them close to the wall, and numbers have been falling generally. How do we turn that tide? Do you think? Yeah, I firmly feel that reaching out to every member of my community and acknowledging the diverse, um, the diverse way that they train, um, finding ways to be as creative as possible to connect, have people connect their art to their lives. Um, I believe that we need to start uh, attending to children when they're four and five and six years old. I now have up until COVID, you know, a group of at least 12, uh, maybe 14 teenagers who were all looking at blue and brown belt and many of those children teenagers came from the from being kids so i i see that i have a whole group of of uh young people coming up and and taking on leadership that will be the future of aikido and without those kids and those 20 small well, 20 somethings i don't i don't have a lot of hope that we at 60 and 70 and 80 can carry it. So I think it's about the, uh, I think it's about really youth a lot. Okay. So, I mean, you've touched it a few times in this conversation, I think. And Dave, oh. that's the last question. Yeah. Mm. Go on, Dave. Yeah, just um, um, in terms of the youth though, I mean, something that we don't do in our organization, I'm not too sure many in the UK do. Um, and I just wondered what you did to um, inspire the youth or the young people to, to train with you? What did you offer them? What, um, how did that um, proliferate? Because I agree that we need, we need to get the, the young people more involved, but I just wanted to what, 
tricks or techniques or initiatives you use to do that? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and really for me, it started, um, I was teaching kids in, in like 1990 at Seattle school. Well, actually I wasn't teaching the kids in 1990. I had, there were other folks doing that, but in 95, when I opened up to Ukraine, I had two kids. Both of those kids went on to Brown and Black Belt, but it started with two kids and then it went to four kids and then it went to 10 kids. One of the things I did was reach out to every single parent, sat down, really expressed the power of what could happen to the children if they trained. Um, one thing led to another. Um, there were folks that became kid teachers. Those, those teachers were, had their own ideas. Now I have a staff of, I don't know, I think maybe 12 teachers in the dojo, uh, black belt uh, teachers who teach the kids and the teens. Um, they all have their creative ways of going about it. They're all attentive to really making relationships with the parents. Um, and it's tribal. The kids like being with kids, particularly teens. So you're not going to get teens advancing unless they want to do it with their friends. And then we have friend day and we, uh, we really emphasize quite a bit of weapons and we treat them as adults and we are hard and we, 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 we train hard with them and with the older ones and the little ones we just we act as though it's um, they're on a they're in a play box they're in a sandbox and we roll around the mat with these four and five and six year olds and people say well that's that's not meaningful but you know what it really is meaningful and those some of those kids stay on and they they train and they now they train in adult classes so i don't know i know that we're just working our ass off to keep that alive and well and expanding thank you very much Graham. thank you um when covid arrived it, it came as a bit of a shock to the whole world and definitely the aikido community what's it taught you You know, I know you know, um, to, to invest in my uh, in my quiet, to invest in my reverence for uh, the planet, to recognize that I'm not hearing um, airplanes. What I'm hearing is new bird sounds. I take five, six mi mile a day walks and, um, and and try to take in the how clean the air is and uh, you know what human beings have done to this planet is somewhat despicable if you will <laughs> so i think we need to heal ourselves and each other and i think we need to give more attention to this beautiful place we live on and take care of it um so that's it's really been a it's really been tough to uh close down a dojo i mean basically um you know we have classes every day sometimes morning noon and night and uh, lots of people who rely on it and now there's a there's a number of people who cannot find their way to zoom uh, it just doesn't appeal to them some of them probably are on zoom all day long in their business so we expect to go back uh to um training uh in the park uh at the anime that that's our expectation and, but we but really we don't know what about you or how are all of you is there a timeline is there a is there a time that you imagine that you will be able to return uh, in some fashion to, to practice or is no, that no uh, sign of that anytime soon i don't think so really we're still in lockdown they're starting to talk about how they might slowly release us from lockdown but i think um aikido will be a bit like air flight travel it'll be one of the last things that you can be encouraged to go back to mm -hmm. i think you know you nobody knows how this is going to unfold but i don't I think this will be happening till quite a bit later in the year at best at best yeah i agree also what they're talking about is uh unlocking by industry so it'll be industries uh like building construction that sort of thing first and then uh, the uh, entertainment areas, the restaurants, the pubs and clubs, and and contact sports. I I just, I, it's going to be one of the last ones to go, uh, mm. unlocked. And also they're they're, they're looking at uh, potentially unlocking by generation. So they're talking about maybe uh, releasing the twenty to thirty year olds first, 
Wow, because really? They were, yeah, there are 4.2 million uh, 20 to 30 year olds that work in the country. So you let them back first because they're least likely to have severe uh, you know, COVID. Ah, interesting. Yeah. As you get older, you become more susceptible and the death rates get higher. So that's the thinking behind that. Oh, I suppose. I don't believe if you do Aikido, that's true, but I'll go with it. I, I keep saying that too. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, in Montana, um, Houseville, Montana, their dojo is going back next week. So just FYI. Yeah. Interesting. There are studies that show that people who exercise have protection against COVID. So that's a good thing. I totally believe that if your immune system, that Aikido encourages a healthy immune system. Yeah, I agree. So in a minute, I'm, Paul, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, well, I'd like to make a comment. Um, I've traveled a bunch and taught in a lot of places, and it seems that Aikido is not violent enough for the current interest. They want to win, they want to have tournaments. Even the ads on television have angry people talking about go places. So it's just, in between the COVID and the fact that we're trying for peace and other people want war, it's difficult to get people interested, young people. Mm. Mm. Well, I think, I think Kimberly's, what Kimberly uh, is, a bit of brilliance in that is to actually say to the parents that are turning up to ch the class, you really should be bringing your children here. I think that's a brilliant strategy actually. So, uh, and you've got a big enough community to make that work or you, to seed the child's program. Some of us haven't right now, but that's a really, really good idea, I think. I also think we deal a lot with kids' disabilities, emotional, psychological, neurological. We, we, we really address every single kid that comes, and there's a lot of kids with a lot of challenges. And, and it's pretty profound to me, Quentin, to see the amazing kindness that, um, that these kids express to one another. I, I, I have to say, I'm, 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 I applaud them and I'm sometimes astounded because uh, again, I'm impatient. So um, mm. I, just I, gonna, I, I, I was just gonna say at eight o'clock on Thursday night, everybody goes out and claps our national health service, sort of like you're doing in America, but our time is eight o'clock on a Thursday, right? Mm. In this session. Um, so um, I'm going to take a vote on this. Guys, do, do, do we want to nominate Liz to do it on our behalf or would we like to take five minutes and do that ourselves? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So at about two minutes to eight, Kimberly, if it's okay with you, we'll take a five minute break. You can get some water or whatever and, and we'll go and do our clapping thing. And those who want to stay here can carry on chatting. Um, and then uh, if we don't mind, we'll, we'll come back and um, finish the session. Um, Benton. Yes. Don't forget that tonight's clap is also for Captain Tom's 100th birthday, so we're going to all be collectively singing happy birthday for him as a nation too. Okay. Don't forget that. Right, well, I won't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I'm sorry, but I have to leave it on the hour. I have two other conferences that I'm... Oh, Lyndon, I just want to say uh, it's so nice to see you. Thank you. It's nice to see you too. Yeah. Wow. It's lovely to see you, Paul. It is. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the exchange. Yeah. So Kimberly, I'm, I'm, I'm going to set you a challenge to uh, come up with a question you would like us all to answer when we sure. get back. Okay, sure. So, so and everyone have Quentin, to jump off that. Yeah. Quentin, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to just call back? Well, you can just leave the room open and, and, and just oh, okay. stay for five minutes or stay chatting with whoever stays here sure. um, as you like. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, it's now 19.53, so we've got a couple of minutes. Um, okay. okay, so you talked about, I asked you what you, what you got from certain teachers. Mm -hmm. what, this is a, I know you're going to hate this question because you're modest, but what would you like to be your legacy in Aikido? What would you like your students to say about that you gave them? I think... Um, I would like them to to um, feel like I was um, I was present with them when I was with them. I was a hundred percent with them. Like that, my attention was was uh, not shifted and not doubled. It was just there. I was present. Anything else? Well, I, I one of my gifts is compassion. One of my gifts is the ability to uh, 
be able to really sense uh, in, in a grounded way what what uh, where the heart is. And um, I think I had that as a kid, just in terms of managing my family structures. And I think I share that with my students. I I think I invite them to feel their hearts and their sense of connectedness to themselves and their their world and and the divine if you will their, their sense of higher power i inspire that great guys i think we've got a chance for one question from the panel so to speak so any of you got a question you'd like to ask Okay, I've got a question. Do you think uh, there's a, a lot of talk about healing the world and this is uh, an opportunity for people to uh, think what the hell's happening? Uh, do you think that when the crisis is over, people will just return back to uh, the commercial greedy norm? Or do you think that there's going to be a, an actual change for the better? Here's, I think that human beings are embryonic and we've only been here for a little while when you think about it in terms of the whole structure of the galaxy. And those people who really made an attempt to find a little more consciousness in it all will absolutely evolve. And those who don't, don't. And I think it's such a mix. And as far as returning to Aikido, I don't know that anybody knows. I just... Some one student said to me, oh my God, maybe Aikido's dead because we can't ever touch each other again in this lifetime. And I'm just like, I'm sorry, I just really can't abide by that because touching is what we do. We are sensory mm -hmm. beings. So um, I think that uh, we will find our ways back and we'll find new ways to consider and respect my eye and uh, our, our ability to connect with each other on a multi multitude of dimensions um, that maybe we're not really focusing on right now. So that's a really cool question. And I would love to know how you feel about that too. I, I think there are a lot of people who, who are, are, are never going to be the same again, which is great. I just hope we're not completely dominated by the, the, the mad greedy lot who want to go, oh my God, we, this is the worst recession, worst recession, oh. whatever. We've got to right. do more to dig more coal get more oil get you know we've now got to make up for lost time god god forbid us you know and i live in a huge area where water is it water is the um and you know i just think the whole message was respect for nature so i really i really can't say and and i have children and grandchildren and for their sake i just I just pray. I put all of my attention and all of my juice into how can we take care of this planet. Mm -hmm. Guys, I'm going to call us our, our five minute break now, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so we'll come back at about three minutes past eight. Okay. So do what you need to do. Okay. I guess not all of us are going to go and clap. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say why you guys are idle. Where I live, uh, Kimberly, I, I, have you ever been to my house? I don't think no, you have. No, but I really, I was, I was sort of looking forward to uh, the possibility the next time I came over. I thought that was going to be really great. Yeah, you've just got to do it. When I live on top of this hill, and uh, it's a tiny little village in the middle of nowhere. So uh, it's one of the best places you could possibly be uh, locked down. Every day I go for about a mile and a half walk up to the top of the mountain. Wow. Um, I do my, take my Bokken every day, and I, I do about, well, three, three, four hundred cuts from breathing. It's just a great way to start the day. That is awesome. And I remember you talking about your beautiful space and your, and your honey and the, whole, and the whole idyllic thing you got going there. Pretty nice. Yeah, really lucky. Hi, Jamie. How are you doing? Hi there. I can vouch for it. I've been there. Oh, my he has. God. Yes, indeed. Oh. I hear that I voice. I hear that familiar voice. That's Jamie. Yeah, Hi, Jamie. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi. Yeah, I've been conducting a session myself, so thought yeah. I'd uh, try to catch you guys. I can but only. He's guess. not exaggerating. This place is great. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. good well, walks. The best hikes. Oh, right out his door. It's amazing. 
Well, I live uh, about a mile from, or about a block from a three mile lake and it's a beautiful lake. And when they haven't, when they've opened it as of last week, we can um, walk that lake pretty daily. And the eagles there and the great blue herons and they fight with the crows and they fight with the mallards. And it's really a great, it's a great way to be in nature on a daily basis, so. I think I've been to that lake, walked around it somewhere in the past. I have, Jamie. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good. Seattle's so just, there's millions of places. So good. It is. It is so good. But there's also millions of people. <laughs> well, it must be amazing to not have traffic in Seattle. I can't imagine. You know, the first week was amazing. The first week to have empty streets was pretty trippy. It's really come back now. It's uh, Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We have, we have traffic now. We don't have air traffic. But, uh, and, you know, they had to close the, the, the parks because it's Coney Island at uh, Green Lake. I mean, people are sunbathing and, you know, people are people. Wow. And where are you, Jamie? You look like you're in the snow. That's my backyard about three weeks ago. <laughs> wow. It's melted now, but that's literally out my back door. I'm on a street. I mean, there's houses here, but um, th this backyard is a big meadow and there's probably 30, 50 houses like lining it. It's just this giant meadow that goes for more than wow. half a mile or something. Yeah. Very that's fortunate. Like, Truckee. Yeah. Truckee, yeah. That's where. Yeah. Feel fortunate here. It's really good. Yeah, clean air. Mm -hmm. Harris, how is your family? Yeah, they're really well. Um, it's very frustrating uh, being locked down, and I've got a new grandson. So, oh! Oh! Uh, yeah, so he's uh, 18 months now. Uh, oh! And in the last six weeks, he's gone from just walking to running, and his vocabulary has just transformed in six weeks. Wow. So, uh, it's extraordinary just watching him on uh, FaceTime and stuff. Oh, nice. But uh, when you say lockdown, are you, are you literally not being able to see and move around uh, with your families and this nothing. and that? Is, that? is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. We're not really supposed to. And when I, when I suggested to my son, he, I said, look, I'm really getting pissed off with his lockdown nonsense. Yeah. Uh, I've been isolated at home and I only see Jill uh, or we go uh, to the shops. So, um, uh, and, and I don't go to the shops very often because the village has a very little tiny shop and, and we can go to that. Um, mm -hmm. So I said, well, can't I come over? And, and he said, well, I'll have to speak to his wife and she's pretty strict on these rules. So um, wow. and all the grandparents are saying, hey, can, can we come over and see our grandson? And, and at the moment, we're not being allowed to. So they're being very strict. It's very frustrating. We don't have that quite as much, actually. But but. Uh, but do you think you did have it pretty strict, didn't you, Kimberly? Yeah, pretty strict. Yeah, well, Inslee was. Perf I actually, I really appreciate it. He's Inslee done great. Before. I like him. Yeah, and there's a great article that just came out in the New Yorker about what Seattle did that New York did not do, and. And uh, it's true. We got some not happy people about it, but I think that he really actually made it so that uh, the, the frontliners are not having to deal with what is going on in New York City at this moment. And yeah, we've had that too with uh, Gavin. Gavin Newsom's yes. been good. And, uh, and they're, they're doing a regional thing. I mean, I think Inslee and Gavin and uh, the governor in Oregon have really, really done well. I was but just I'm surprised. I didn't know Seattle was kind of coming back so, so much so fast yeah and it's a real crapshoot right because i think he's just uh, just today he announced that he's uh, encouraging lockdown uh uh up and up, up through the middle uh, to the end of the month but there's still things that are opening up here and as pierce mentioned construction is one of them and that's that's quite a irritating irritant to uh to folks who are the small business owners and the restaurants and whatnot that they would support construction over that but because we have so much construction in this city yeah anyway well, the politics of the whole thing is a little intense <laughs> i think so i think really for me it's just an issue of dealing with hearts more than that you know just just uh and dealing with assurance because there is quite a bit of fear there's fear i mean just the tr it's just been transformative the way my even my neighbors experience uh relate to me you know mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you mean uh, Kimberly 
I mean that um, if you've had if you've had challenges in your life, if you've had strokes or heart attacks or this or that, or you've had things that have been difficult for you in your immune system, and suddenly you know um, everything around you um, you know is a moving target, then I think I'm I'm, I'm experiencing people who I really love and I know pretty well just say you know I'm going to just stay back and. So that fear is pretty palpable. It's, um, and I have deep compassion for them really feeling like, excuse me, Sarah. Um, I have deep compassion for that level of fear um, and, and that level of anxiety, you know, uh, from a moment to moment basis. I think it took a while um, over here as well that, that, that we had a new norm, this sort of social distancing norm. And, and it's so alien. Uh, I mean, I remember back in the uh, middle of February, I went to a charity to align ourselves with that charity. We wanted to give them some of our stuff and, yeah. and, and, and help them, and they were going to help us with publicity. Mm -hmm. And, and at, just at that time, we were told, you shouldn't be shaking hands. And it's so difficult not to shake hands. But now that's the new norm. I mean, no one even thinks about shaking hands. And, and you know, we've, we're often a huggy society. And, and now the new norm is, okay, I'll go and, I mean, I went to see my sister, which I wasn't supposed to do last Wednesday, um, but I went to see her and, and I didn't hug my sister. I didn't hug my nieces. And, and, and ne neither party even thought about it. We, the, just the new norm is you stay four or five feet apart, which is totally alien. But, but you, you now, when you meet somebody, you don't feel affronted that you haven't uh, done this shaking hands or getting close. Interesting. Put us back to the main session. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We'll get sunk in COVID talk, and I'm fed up with talking COVID. There you are. Qu Quentin, we can restart here. This might. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> Saved. <laughs> Saved by the <laughs> brain. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's not fair, Kimberly, because they, they didn't give you any space or time to think about the question you might want to ask us, but I'm hoping you're inspired and have one. Well, I, I'm inspired by what you're inspired by right now. I mean, as I'm sitting here speaking with you, probably the best thing that's happening to me today is I'm watching these chickadees build this nest right in front of my um, dogwood tree here in my office. and. It, and I could just spend all day watching those two little creatures uh, be very sort of tidy and, and careful because the crows are right there. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of that, like what is inspiring you right now with your, your years of Aikido and what you're, how you're going to put that out to, um, to really have an impact. Each one of you has an impact. So I, I would really be curious how you're doing that. Who wants to answer first? I'll get the ball rolling then. See a plethora of hands there. Um, okay, for what inspires me, uh, I actually think this is a time of opportunity. So I'd rather see it as a time of opportunity rather than a dreadful thing. Uh, I'm working, working that opportunity. That's inspiring. Um, and the other thing is just having the time to notice the little stuff. I mean, I had a pretty balanced and chilled life anyway, but more so now. And just getting out and seeing what's changing in the garden every day. Yes. Is a real joy. So that's my answer. If you don't put your hand up, I'll just volunteer you. All right, Quentin. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi, Liz. Oh, hello. Love it. Thank you very much for everything you've said this evening. Oh. Well, it's evening to us anyway. It's just been wonderful. Yeah. Um, I've just thought, I think like a lot of people, my life is normally really hectic. I'm running around doing everything. I'm working. I'm being a mum. I'm active in our local Labour Party. Um, I'm parish. You know, it just does not stop, does it? Does and it? with the way things have changed now it's actually slowing down in a very but in a very positive and constructive way and finding the power of silence the power of quiet living it's incredible and it's almost like i i, I feel like I would only have experienced this otherwise if I joined a, a nunnery or something. 
you went on a you went on a 20 day retreat right yes exactly it's like except i feel like i'm on a, a, on, a on a retreat and it's amazing and i'm still finding out what what effects it's having but little things like i say going for a walk every day and really hearing the bird song now i've always loved listening to the birds but now the planes are stopped because we're on a flight path from heathrow and now there's very few cars coming through and i've we can hear, we hear them properly, and the birds themselves are happier and oh, they're so happy and making so. It's amazing what, how the natural world has really come to life. And and I totally agree, Kimberly, what you were saying earlier that the planet is seriously trying to tell us something now. I agree. Deborah, come on, it's your moment. Unmute. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, <laughs> what inspires me? Uh, a lot of the things that people have already said, but also um, just the love that's being shown in so many different ways. Um, the and the love that I'm, I think perhaps just by like stopping more, like people were saying, I'm also seeing, not all the time <laughs> by any means, but <laughs> at least some of the time I'm seeing, like I'm giving space for more love to come up in myself as well. And, and just to kind of allow it. Um, and, and just so many examples of, of, people thinking about others, of people helping others in all kinds of ways and and yeah, so that's what inspires me the most, I think, is just all the love that's coming out of this in so many ways from so many people in so many places. That's a lot, thank you. Laura and Nick, unmute, short moment. I'm mute, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants well, to go first? Oh, Nick, apparently. Well, it's, it's kind of diff difficult to actually add something new to what already has been said. And uh, obviously, kind of like, uh, we live in very interesting times. The, um, you know, it's good to be able to, you know, just go outside and, you know, as I think as Lisbeth uh, said, um, like, just listen to the bird song. It's fantastic. The atmosphere kind of like you know the air sm smells better, and uh, you know at least I, I tend to you know to, to feel happier kind of like more more perhaps you know attuned to to nature or attuned and in tune I think with nature as well. So obviously I have very good company, uh, but uh, yeah. you know. <laughs> but there's this kind of like uh, I, I'm I'm at the same time you know trying to keep an eye on, on you know how things are, are going outside and you know I cannot really um, help myself kind of like register a little bit of, of, of um, anxiety or kind of like you know how we're going to move forward because uh, you know mm -hmm. it's nice to you know to hear and obviously you know within our, our environment and obviously kind of like you know throughout you know reaching out you know globally really you know our, fr our killer friends and saying you know how, how you know great an opportunity is but like uh, it's still missing the dialogue of like what we need to do and I had to, to, to uh, realize kind of like, you know, the, the, but we need to act now. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, I said, kind of like, uh, I'm just kind of still grappling with, with these ideas. And Laura, how we must you want to add? Yeah, I would say that I feel hope actually at this time. I felt before like everything was very depressing <laughs> because <laughs> of everyone was uh, super intensely worried about climate change, Brexit, recession, austerity, everything was very depressing, terrorism. Mm. Um, but now I feel like, um, you know, collectively as a nation, we're all a lot more appreciative of mm. the natural world and we see how it can recover. So we kind of, I feel like there is a way opening up to how we could live differently in terms of how to tackle climate change and that we don't have to be like lemmings just uh, <laughs> following each other up a cliff. Um, and people's attitudes have changed. Mm -hmm. Like um, for me, I always thought that the 
public health system was really important and that carers were really important. And then, you know, uh, like we only recently had an election where I felt that yeah. that wasn't really valued by the majority of people's yeah. decision. Yeah. But now everybody seems to reverse their thinking and actually think, oh yeah, that is really important. So to me, things in some ways, like people's ideas and values are shifting. To me, that's quite a hopeful thing. Mm. Um, and I also think what Piers was saying in the break was about, you know, um, are we, are we going to keep up with shift away from consumerism? So I really hope that we will. And for me personally, I feel less anxiety now because I think there's less pressure to... Um, feel less of the uh, fear of missing out. You, you should be doing this and that and you should be improving your home and you should be buying new clothes and you should be, you know, you just, usually you're on such a hamster wheel of life. You think like you're yep. always failing because, you know, yep. I haven't put on any makeup this morning. I don't look good enough or I haven't prepared enough for my work meeting or, you know, maybe I haven't made it to Aikido tonight because I'm too tired or something like, there's a lot of guilt that you're not doing enough. And then when you can't do these things and you can't buy things because they're not even in the shop or, you know, if you, they're not in stock or whatever, you just have to let go of all that and think all that can wait. And then you actually realize that oh, you don't need to do all that. And all that was uh, false. Thank you, Laura. Hugh. Quinton, thanks. Um, I think, first of all, these, these online sessions have been absolutely fantastic. There's been a great coming together and a great um, solidarity within the Aikido community, which has been really very pleasant indeed. And I think we're all privileged to be part of it and have the training individually to get through some of these things. I also think, though, that you know, we, we'll, most of us are lucky enough, maybe we've got a bit of a garden, we've got a little bit of um, savings, we've got a little bit of uh, leeway to manage these difficult times. But I think there are an awful lot of people who are suffering very badly indeed, um, locked up in a, in, a, in, a, in a small place, maybe lost their jobs, maybe in the gig economy with very little on the horizon to come back maybe with an abusive partner that you're locked in with all these things which you know listening to nature and 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 going for the walks and and being at peace with oneself is good but there are a lot of people who are not in that situation um and i think that we are in for a very challenging time i was reading an article which was really shocked me a little bit by the pulitzer prize winner chris hedges today these are the good times compared to what's coming next and it was it was largely a, a sort of critique on america and the political and economic situation a division there but these things apply in in many other places and your own question quentin is how, how do we use all this to in 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 daily life to take it forward it is going to be very important to bring this training to bear in what is what is in front of us and i think outside of the tremendous tension at the front line of the nhs in certainly in the uk and hospitals and uh, health systems around the country uh, around the world today um we could see a, a, a tremendous unleashing of energy both positive and negative when when the barriers start coming down again and and it is behoves all of us to to be ready for that and to do our own little bit to help other people through what is ahead. I would like to speak to that for just a moment, Hugh, because I completely agree with you that what's coming is is um, worth spending a, a tremendous amount of attention on. And I think that the second uh, virus re really will be our loneliness, our isolation, our anxiety, and our depression from all of this. And um, I think Aikido really needs to be prepared to, to, uh, to, have some, to have some impact as a method and as a way and, and, and really think out of the box enough um, 
to, to, to imagine that we could be helpful as a de-stressor or helpful uh, in terms of the domestic violence, massive amounts of domestic violence that is, that is coming out of this. And I can see it in my own community and I can see it uh, in, my, in, in, in my Aikido community. I can see it in Seattle. And I think that we really actually be, need to be preparing right now for what you're saying. Uh, so that we can be viable in, in some in some way to treat to to be with, for people. Judith, you've unmuted. So, what about you? Okay, um, a couple of things. Uh, I'm agreeing with what Deborah said. Right, it's so wonderful to see so much kindness and compassion. People looking out for each other. I went out in my back garden a couple of weeks ago, and all you could hear was people calling across the garden to check everyone was okay. They've got everything they needed. Uh, also, the fact that I've been ill long term and often I can't get out of my house, but now everybody's doing things on Zoom so I can be connected with people much better. I'm doing spiritual inquiry with Beyond Soar uh, every day and I'm doing Aikido most days as well, what I can do of it. Brilliant. So, yeah, awesome. it's, uh, lots of positive things coming out. That's awesome. Josh, I see you've unmuted. So do you want to give us your inspiration? Yeah, I can share a few words. And sorry, I'm not sharing video today, but I'm in a lot of pain. So I figured I'd stick to audio. Um, no problem. So I think very existentially, like all of my life and especially at this time. So with your question about what inspires us with Aikido, where we're at, where are we moving forward? Um, I think, I mean, when you really think about moment to moment, hour to hour, day to day, and then we go to sleep and wake up another day, uh, we can interact with each other person to person, which is limited now, but in terms of everything that we've trained in the past and everything we're trying to learn moving forward, it, that's, that's half of it, right? How are we going to be with other people whenever our, there's any intersection of a life or of two bodies, two minds in one place? And to me, especially with, uh, I think Hugh mentioned in terms of forecasting for the future, um, even though I haven't been training relatively that long, really less than two years now, uh, there's the knowledge of how, uh, uh, absolutely critically significant the, the kind of embodied, mindful, centered presence of someone that has that somatic awareness of where we're at and where our mind goes, which is so much of Aikido, to someone who does not. So in any situation, being able to always return to that, um, both practicing on our own and where it comes up, I think is critical, essential, and hopefully really, not hopefully, I think very much a lot of the hopefulness for me in terms of one-to-one -one interactions, and that's gonna change for all of us based on who we're going to be with in the next few days, weeks, months, and years, and decades of where we're all at. And then the other is just what we can do in terms of our, our connections with others non-locally like this. Um, and that seems to be so much about what you and Aiki Extensions and all of this is about, especially within Aikido, is what are the structures non-locally happening through technology and also not technology to be able to um, have those kind of same things start rippling outward and that seems like it's still really just kind of trying to form and merge into something and i hope to be more a part of that moving forward because it seems like there's so much vision there it just doesn't quite have the uh what that all is going to look like yet and then uh the last and then to tie it into your question you use the word inspiration nothing really inspires me now to be honest but there's a there's kind of a soulful subtle hope inside of me that's keeping me going through my own situation that I know you come to know about and for others somewhat, but mostly um, I'm just going through a lot of my own uh, deep health issues, not COVID related so far as I know. Uh, and also trying to find a place to arrive. Um, so for me, it's interesting that um, Kimberly, you're from, you, you teach in Seattle. I'm in the Midwest now. I'm from uh, St. Louis, Missouri. That's where I'm living. And I've considered going out to Seattle. I'm looking for a place kind of in a, everywhere I go and everyone I talk to isn't in the same situation, which is what place can I put myself that all of the kind of butterfly effects of all of our actions uh, will be a part of that whole, I think so many people are always saying they're hopeful about and trying to move towards. So yeah, that's a, that's a lot of thought, um, a lot of words. This is where I'm at, but I always try and return to the question because that was the 
the frame for it is just every time we have a one one with anyone in any situation our embodied practice is going to be a part of that and then also how do we uh amplify that through whatever we put our mind on but not our bodies namely every time we're on a computer or a phone um, thanks for that josh I, I really appreciate the fact that you're seeing it as something that every interaction you have with another human being it's part of all the same thing um, steve can i bring you into the conversation what inspires you steve Sorry? You, what oh, inspires yeah. you uh, what, to answer your question? No, Kimberly's question. Oh, Kimberly's. Oh, yes, of course it was. It's so long ago. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, in, in my case, I'm lucky I can get out, you know, half an hour with the dog, etc. But when I am out, because he's a guide dog, people come well within the rules of distancing. Mm to talk to the dog and I, I keep saying can you back off when people think I'm mad or, or something but I just, <laughs> you know but I mean I don't see anyone now for about eight weeks wow that's a long and time I'm, I'm okay with it um, but I'm beginning to wonder how much more I've got to deal with but I, I think when I need to, I should get the appropriate people in, you know. Um, but the, the key question, uh, Kimberly, was about when I was last working with you, your Aikido was smooth, soft, and yet firm. How many years did that take you to get there? <laughs> <laughs> Still working on it, Steve. <laughs> I'll let you know when I got it. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh my God. Great question. Caroline, would you Lovely. like to un unmute and tell us what inspires you? <laughs> right inside. So, <laughs> Caroline. Are you, talk are you talking to me, Sensei? I am. You're the only Caroline here. So, what inspires you right now? Ah. Uh... Ooh. This is not fair because I had to answer another call for five minutes. So I haven't been able to hear it. <laughs> want me to come back to you when you've had a chance to think about it. And okay. I'll move to Jamie. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, happy birthday for um, yesterday, by the way. What <laughs> inspires you right now? Uh, um, well, you know, I, uh, just relating to what uh, everybody's talking about, um, you know, like what Laura was saying, I was kind of done with my lifestyle in a certain sense. I really, and with everything. And I think that, um, you know, I'm used to jumping on airplanes and rental cars and all of that. I'm zooming around now. So I'm saving all that time and energy, which is kind of cool. <laughs> I'm actually meeting more people and, um, you know, these forms and the more that we actually get together and I see people coming together um, is, is just really amazing. I'm finding a lot of opportunities opening up. I mean, I feel like one of the fortunate ones. I'm, I've been sheltered for eight weeks. I'm, I'm writing, mm. I'm creating, I'm you know, doing a lot of things. But I think, you know, it's been like, a, you know, a shift in personal lifestyle and collective lifestyle. I don't think we, no one's ever been through this before and had this opportunity to stop, to sit still, to watch nature renew within a matter of weeks or months is, is you know, really mm. encouraging. Uh, we've got to shift everything. We knew that before, and man, you know, we weren't paying. We didn't pay attention. I was like, okay, now we got a huge pandemic. Like, are you gonna pay attention? And you know, people, I think, I think are, and I think that, um, uh, you know, speaking of like Aiki extensions in terms of Aikido, um, you know, we're looking more deeply into ourselves because we don't have the uke there, <laughs> and uh, so we're, we're in here more, and. Um, and, and really looking at these questions, I think people in Aikido who have not necessarily been like, uh, you know, we have so much looking at how do we extend Aikido? How does that make a difference in our, in our values and how we live and how, how we go about our relationships, um, a more peaceful kind of power, more harmonious with one another, with nature, you know, all these kinds of things that are part of Aikido. How do we be more balanced and centered? Um, how do we shift maybe our consumerism and, and all of those things um, that, you know, and what, what does Aikido contribute to that conversation? So I think we're, uh, in Aikido, people are starting to go more deeply into themselves and also into the 
all the questions of how do we apply and use Aikido um, in our lives and to help uh, contribute to this world that we want to, uh, an, an emerging new and better world that we want to be an active part of that, that conversation. So I think we have a lot of opportunities and, I, and they're showing themselves as well. Um, and, uh, you know, to take them, but I think we're going in different directions, more deeply inward, more deeply into the meaning of Aikido and what it can do, uh, beyond, you know, Nikkyo's and, and Shionagi's and stuff. So all of that stuff's inspiring me. I feel, um, you know, I, I, this is a really rich time. I've never stopped. I'm like, you're go, 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 go. So I'm going, but from here and it's, it's been really good. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm appreciative of it. And, and so appreciative to both all these kinds of opportunities to, to get together that uh, technology's affording. So yeah, thank you. And I think there's thank a lot, you. a lot that can happen and is happening in this time. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Mitra. Yes. Uh, well, the first thing is that the silence, a pause was forced upon us. And that was a good pause. It was a good uh, silence. And Silence is also important in Aikido because to connect with the, your inner self and your center, it, it presupposes internal mental silence. And in the, even in the middle of moving, so one of the good things, because I really think it's an opportunity for us all globally, uh, the first benefit that I see is this silence that leads you into your presence and to a journey to look inward. So this is a very positive thing. And uh, it is also related to our daily practice. And the second thing, I, I live in Athens, Greece. And uh, what I see here with this lockdown, a lot of compassionate work has been happening in the community, like groups have been organized to help the homeless and um, take care of them, people who really because people are complaining about the lockdown, but how about the homeless who don't even have a home to stay in? So a lot of um, community groups have been organized to help those people, also groups to help the immigrants, because we have lots, thousands of them coming illegally from Turkey to Greek borders and European borders. So uh, a lot of compassionate work has grown and keeps growing out of this, which is wonderful. And, um, also, I think that globally, we all have to see when this slowly or rapidly comes to an end, it is very important to see what will the next day be like or the next months be like. It's very crucial that we pay attention globally that we don't go back to the same running madness. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. And how we can help with that individually. Mm -hmm. I... I personally feel well because that gave me more time to practice. I practice every day. I can offer three times a week free online classes to the people who train with me. And I'm very, I'm very grateful for that. They also feel very well for, for having this. And um, it's just a beautiful opportunity to look more inward and have more silence. Thank you. So, and I just, uh, before ending, I just want to thank uh, uh, Kimberly Richards for this wonderful sharing from the heart that she did with all of us. Caroline, are you ready now? Have you thought of some inspiration? Uh, <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Um, I've been thinking on a sort of more practical note a bit about the things you were asking us just before we stopped about how to get more people in the club and what people might come to Aikido for. Mm. And then in my own life, um, I'm looking at my job as an acupuncturist and wondering when on earth I'm going to be able to get back to work, mm. <laughs> which may be difficult. And uh, uh, looking at doing a bit more sport and movement as part of um, helping people. Mm. And um, I was thinking about why it is we even stay active and about interoception, our internal sense of ourselves. And sorry, my dog is pestering me. Um, <laughs> Aikido has so much of that. Aikido has, has those kind of real magic moments. I mean, even, even the, um, you know, the very simple unbendable arm, finding one point. Um, and whether uh, there's a way to access some of that and take that to people 
in a really, really basic way, in a way. Mm. You need to develop two foot, two meter long needles, I think, then you should be all right on the acupuncture front. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've, been, I've have done some acupuncture with people online. <laughs> it's not quite the same. Piers, you've been very quiet. Inspiration, please. Uh, yeah, I've, I've actually, because I've, I, I, uh, sort of still working. Um, I, I run a manufacturing company and uh, actually looking after 15 or 16 people and making sure that their mental well-being is okay and that they've got enough to do. And, and actually, I'm, I'm working harder now at the moment than I was before. And, yeah, and that's because, because we're all working from home, everyone thinks that, oh, I, I usually work three days a week for that company and a day a week for someone else. And actually, because you're at home, you, they just think, oh, he's contactable, so we'll just ask him their stuff. So that's been actually quite uh, tiring and stressful. What's been inspirational is my daily walks. And uh, I, I, I mean, I used to have a dog. I haven't had a dog for about eight years. And, and walking up on the hill every day has been truly wonderful because the weather's been so marvelous. So that's been fantastic. And, and I think... Uh, no, I'm not fantastic with social media and, and all the tech. And yet I've been running Aikido classes on a Tuesday night and Demetra's been there and, and, and she runs a Qigong session for me. And, and I've reached out to all sorts of people. Shemek uh, did a class for me and my son and my son-in-law who are specialists in chiropractic and neurology and physiotherapy. And they all come in and they do all this stuff. And then I got asked to do a 40 minute class in Warsaw and, and you see all these kids and all these parents doing their Aikido in the room and they're following you and you just think, oh my God, this is absolutely fantastic. Absolutely. And no, you can't, you can't throw people, but, but they're giving it a go because I love these sessions. They're really interesting, but I wanted to do something that was to do with moving and and I, I've made contact with one of my Dan grades who's now in South Africa and he's coming to my classes on a Tuesday night. I've got a Dan grade who emigrated down to deepest, darkest Kent and he's coming to the classes. And so you're making contacts with people that have moved away and I'm getting more people coming to the digital class than come to my physical class. <laughs> and that's inspiration. Yeah, wait, let's not go there, Piers. <laughs> and, and then you think, well, maybe this sort of thing should carry on afterwards. And you think, well, maybe that's one of the ways where you can actually inspire people to get off their asses, mm -hmm. start online, and then maybe they'll transfer to the club. So the tech and the, the, the contacts, that's actually quite inspirational, I think. Mm -hmm. I agree. Dave, you, I'm not sure what you were here when the question was asked. The qu question Kimberly asked was, what inspires you right now? So you can unmute and unload. Oh, um, that's a bit, what inspires me quite now. I, I just think the, um, um, the, the, the Zoom community at the moment is, 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 is inspirational for me. I got a really nice invite to come and join Kimberly and her crew, crew watching some uh, videos of the teacher they had and, and, and sharing that across 7,000, 8,000 miles was, was, was really uh, special. I've had uh, training courses with people on three continents at the same time. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of nice people trying to do lovely things, sharing their time, sharing experiences. Um, and there's, there's such a lot of, yeah, there's some wonderful people out there doing great things. And I, that, that inspires me to go and do, try and do what they're doing, I think. And, um, and people, I guess, have got the time now to go and spend the time to think about these things and, and, and create these opportunities. And um, I think, you know, it, it, so, yeah, it's good that, that people have the chance to do that and go out and, and do this, this great stuff. Um, it, all of that's just inspirational, just seeing what my friends are doing, what my colleagues are doing. Um, and, yeah, and just the opportunity to share and be open and honest and, and this, 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 Certainly this uh, forum is, is excellent for that. You can see your faces, you can see your gestures, you can hear it in your voice. It's much, much nicer than, not as good as being physically there in the room and giving you a hug and a throw, but, um, but it's, you know, it, it's, a, it's a great substitute. And I think, it's, um, I, think, I think some of this will continue afterwards, I'm sure. Um, 
and that's going to be the challenge. How do we mix this and, uh, and real life, I guess, when real life moves back into flow? is real life it's just a different form of real life kimberly Quent quentin can i just add one word of thank you for a specific piece of inspiration if i may and that's to jamie from a couple of weeks ago who um was describing the real meaning behind some hebrew expressions and um which i found very fascinating because i've been doing it quite a lot of that with will read in Japan on the real meaning behind Japanese phrases. But um, one of the things I've been doing during this period of lockdown, which has been uh, really inspiring and a great deal of fun, is I challenged a senior friend of mine who's rather good at haiku to write a haiku every day to each other. So mm -hmm. mine have tended to try and reflect the, the environment that we're in. And one of the phrases that Jamie mentioned the other day was uh, pe the, the translation of paying attention, forgive me, I forget the Hebrew uh, word, uh, was to put your heart to it. And this just brought out a small haiku, which sort of relates to the NHS effort, I think, of paying attention, eyes shining behind the mask, put your heart to it. Mm. And it just seemed to sum up the the moment and thank you for it thank you quentin can i just say one other thing that was uh, uh inspirational to me and and that is uh, just the classes that laura and uh and nick and david have been running on a saturday morning uh uh i don't know kimberly he uh, david is a, a friend of nick and laura's and he's uh, an eido master uh, expert teacher way way ahead of me and that's all i'm ever in, interested in is if the guy knows five percent more than me then that's fantastic because he can pass it on and and he's been doing these amazing classes um uh, and I, that's why i take my bucket everywhere with me uh, <laughs> I, I, was, I was walking past this father and daughter who really gave me a very worried look <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is this guy carrying around a wooden sword for? <laughs> Piers, I'm really looking forward to hearing about your conversation with a police officer. Or something. Nah, it, it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> it's slightly illegal, I would suggest, but there you go. It, it is illegal, but fortunately, I've got two policemen in my club, and they'll probably uh, they'll probably vouch for me. Any <laughs> last word to you? Thank you. Okay. okay, well, um, this session has flown by for me. Yeah, I just want to express my thanks to you. You've been great with the sharing. It's just been lovely. It's been like sitting in a lounge with old friends, really, and, uh, and, and been a real joy to hear what you had to say. Um, yeah, I do feel just, like it's about friendship. I really do. And we're all here together and we're looking at each other's um, aspirations and hopes and dreams and ang anguishes and it's pretty great that we ha we have each other, you know. Do you guys in America know uh, Michael Parkinson? No, You're gonna get, I'm not sure that I know that person. Okay, so he 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 was a very very famous uh, English. Uh, he had a, a a chat show on TV every Saturday night for decades, and he was he was smooth and good looking, had quite a good sense of humour. I think Quentin's taking over from him. <laughs> <laughs> From one brother to another, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, so, that for a second. Okay. I'm, I'm so proud of him, I can't tell you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That, that's got to be so a finisher fun. for me. <laughs> so happy to see you all. Take care yeah. and, and hold all your heart. Right. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank so you. happy to see you. Bye, Bye, Thank Thank brilliant. You. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Take Thanks, care, everyone. Well. Uh, you come back and see us, Kimberly. Come I'll again. Be I'll be so delighted. Yeah. yeah. I look forward to waiting for you. <laughs> all, right. all right. Take care, you all. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. I'm going to close the room now. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.